Okay, um, so I'm from Bristol University. I finished my um, PhD, but um, the um, what I'm what I'm going to show you today is actually the the data that I collected and analysed for my PhD, which again is a small scale study. I'm not. Um, I only looked at four or five families, and um, I'm not uh, um, uh, attempting to draw generalisations across the population. So, <laughs> it's about, so what, I, um, what I want to, to do um, today is, is take you through um, the, the development of my own interest in agency, because my study was about technology in preschool children's lives. And, and as I um, studied and, and looked at what, at what I was finding, observing, um, something about agency started to come out really strongly. So um, I've uh, since, since you know, during the course of finishing the PhD and then since then I've been looking at literature on, on agency, but I'm still really not quite sure what we mean by it. And um, so one of the reasons why I'm here is to try and, and develop that a bit. So I will end, if I get time, because this might run on too long, I'll try and be short, um, by, by showing you some of the um, literature that I've started to look at on agency, and it would be interesting to have your input and your re reflections on that and maybe some of the other questions that have arisen. So, as I've said, I was looking at technology in preschool children's lives, and I went um, to visit some families in Bristol and asked them um, what technologies they had in the home, what they used themselves or the um, elder siblings used, and um, how their young children, can you see all these properly, mm -hmm. um, got involved in, in using that. And they'd already agreed before I went to visit them that they would be happy to make videos for me. So I left them with a tripod and a camera and ask them to make maybe you know tw up to about 20 minutes worth of video of the situations that they described where they use tech the child used technology alongside somebody else and actually all the families gave me a whole hour of, of video um, so I really had quite a lot to, to look at um, and I'll give you some some brief examples of, of some of the things that come out of the video although I'm not actually presenting any video it itself. So just an outline of what I'm going to try and achieve. How much time have I got, by the way? Half an hour. Half an hour, okay. Um, I want to um, talk about the theory about interaction and learning that um, I took me into the study. Um, and then the, the thing that was a, a kind of big for me, which was about approaches to studying interaction between adults and children. And I'll, I'll touch on agency. Um, and then I will um, show you examples of adults and children using di digital technologies at home. And then I hope we'll have a discussion about what the difference the artefact makes. Um, and, and also, if time, some talk about um, a agency and design. So the thing that is actually going to take up most of the time will be this number two. I'll get on with it. <laughs> so, um, uh, I just those of you who are familiar with Vygotsky, you can raise a hand if you are. Yes, great. We'll probably be familiar with this quote or a version of it. Um, and so what we're saying is learning is fundamentally social. Any function in the child's cultural development appears twice on two planes. First, it appears on the social plane and then on the psychological plane. First, it appears between people as an interpsychological category. And then within the child, as an intra-psychological category. Then Vygotsky says, this is equally true with regard to voluntary attention, logical memory, the formation of concepts, and the development of volition. So there's something quite interesting in here, isn't it, when we're thinking about agency? Because what I've, the ideas that I've been playing with are about voluntary attention and, and volition. And so I think Vygotsky is probably talking about agency there, but it's not... As far as I know, it's not developed further um, in, his, in his work. So the previous slide I had um, is about Trevathan. Do you know about it? Okay, so some people do, some people. Um, so there's some really, I think, absolutely lovely work, which um, D Trevathan and other people, which demonstrates that children come into, into the world um, already um, 
uh, ready for um, for interaction with others. And I think this possibly it's it may not necessarily be true for children who are autistic, but that's not my field. So, um, you know, this that that's kind of an interest, obviously a very interesting question. So then Travolta says. Uh, did, separates primary from secondary and sub into subjectivity. Basically, he's saying around the year of age, there, there's um, the, conte the context in which interaction happens becomes um, more, more relevant. I'm not going to go on into this any further because I could get bogged down in it. Yeah, take it um, so my approach to artifacts is that they're part of the physical environment in which we act. And they are um, given meaning um, by the people who are using them. So this, this quote actually comes from the com computer-supported CSCL literature, which is sort of where I kind of belong in, in my work around technology. So um, it, the meaning of artifacts is constituted in dialogue between participants who, through their actions, are responding to various contextual features of the setting and thereby making them relevant. We'll go past that, but it's just to mention that this comes up in the computer-supported collaborative learning literature, which is as well as it as work around young children. Um, so just in, in summary, in that quick whiz to introduce where I'm coming from, learning is, I understand, as meaning-making, interpersonal activity in a context. Um, attention is important. Meaning-making involves relating between known and new and the, the moving on um, to the next bit is uh, that that work around what what we understand about interaction learning is grounded in the traditional of studying the adult child dyad and that's what I want to um, quickly look at so um, are many people familiar with the scaffolding study with Bruno and Ross 1976 so you've heard of scaffolding so this, the, the, uh, the study that, where, that gave birth to the idea of scaffold, term scaffolding comes from a study of um, an, uh, an adult ex experimenter, tutor, and um, children, and they were building a, a, a tower. And it's an um, uh, analysis of the inter interactions between the, the tutor and the child. So this, stu this study, which is by Jim Vetch and his colleagues, was a few years later than that, and it has a kind of similar structure. But it, he was looking at um, adults, and um, uh, the, the adults were parents, and so they were their own children. And they, the, the way that they were looking at this problem, this, this interaction was as problem solving, uh, with this very Vygotskyan idea. So they... Were co they um, they were concerned not with the child as an individual, but the child in a in in a, a what they call a social system. And they gave the, the in the in the study they gave adults and children this puzzle, uh, truck puzzle. So they, had, they there's the blank, then there's a, a, a picture, and there's a pile of um, pieces. So they they conceive the problem solving as taking the piece, looking at the copy working out where it needs to go and then putting it in the place. Um, so um, just have a look at those round pieces. This is a piece of the one of their transcripts and they show that their child um, picks the piece up and calls it a cracker. Look, it's a cracker. Um, and the mum says, oh yes, they look like crackers. And, and in through the course of the dialogue, the child comes, the, the, the adult is working to bring the child's um, understanding to what hers is. So um, I, the reason I introduced this subject is actually not to, this, this study, is not to dwell on the study, but to look at the, some very interesting criticisms. And my work kind of took off when I discovered these criticisms as lots of little lights went on for me. So um, this, these, the criticisms come from a, a team um, from Holland in the early and mid 90s, um, led by Ed Elvers. And um, to sum up, they said that study must be regarded as culturally specific. What the experimenters have studied is a specific mode of interaction. So, this, this is a key phrase. 
but they and the parents in the experimental situation that they have set up consider is the norm. They say the instructional mode of interaction is a restricted mode of interaction. It does exist, but only under special conditions, such as an instructive situation in which a child is prepared to follow precisely the lead of the adult. In such a teacher-pupil relationship, the pupil expects the teacher to take the responsibility for the task, and the pupil is willing to adopt the teacher's situation definition. I'm going to take you through another quote because it brings out some quite important concepts. So this is a, another group who've work, been, been working on this idea of situation de definition since then. The learner's role is only to solve problems or accomplish what they call a monological goal, goal set by the instructor. And, and there is no margin for learners to define the task or set their own goals. The goal is regarded as being predetermined, unilateral and non-negotiable. There being a monological goal as defined by the adult instructor in any task setting. So uh, I don't want to um, start giving the impression that the in instruction is necessarily a bad thing, but it was really the point that they're making was that in this, this study about, of problem solving, there was this idea that the, the goal was, was the adult and the interaction was sustained by the adult. So I've set this out in the table, and as you may guess, I'm going to <laughs> start filling it in with some other modes of interaction that I discovered as I trawled through the literature. So how many people are familiar with Tizard and Hughes' Young Children Learning, 1984? No? It's a, it's a lovely, lovely book. Yeah. <laughs> really nice and easy to read. So Barbara Tizard and Martin Hughes um, studied four-year-old girls um, at home, um, interacting with their mums and in the nursery interacting with the teachers and they looked at the different kinds of activities and dialogue and the sort of things that went on between them. And one of the things that they describe in their lovely book is something that they call passages of intellectual search. They characterise this four-year-old as the kind of puzzling person wanting to work out the world and they ask her loads of questions and anyone who's familiar with children that age know there's lots and lots of questions. And it, so they, they talk about a form of dialogue where the child opens it with a question and continues to sustain it with persistent questioning. And that they suggest, and other people, that it's actually a very potent form of su supporting their learning because their questioning and initi initiation of interactions with other people creates situations which, in response to their curiosity, <coughs> They are frequently offered information which is outside the Im immediate situation. So I'll characterise this mode of interaction as, as um, set and sustained by the both set and sustained by the child. So I'm off looking for more modes of interaction, and I found um, something very interesting, call, um, which I've called joint imaginative talk and pretense. Um, and it's um, what I'm. What, what I'm doing is looking at joint involvement in between children and others in imaginative play as um, a means to, that supports their learning. Now, Paul Harris has written a couple of really interesting books. This one, 2000, and then another one just this year, which is about children learning from testimony, so um, uh, learning from what other people tell you. So um, we, we're now starting to think back towards instruction, and, then, and that's an important point that he, that he makes. So what Paul Harris argues quite strongly is that um, make, make believe and imaginative play are the means by which children develop their ability to imagine alternative possibilities and to work out their implications, which are, is the kind of, the, let's call it the cognitive me mechanisms or the practice that, that they need to have to be able to accept an idea from you and then take it somewhere. So what he, he says is that um, the children already start school able to learn from instruction, and the way, you, the way that they prepare themselves for it is, um, uh, is, is through it, it imagining something happening and then working it through. So he says, um, when children start to engage in joint presents, they must be aware to the stipulations that their play partner introduces, like a teacher, as a teacher might later or in a different context. 
These stipulations can fly in the face of reality. They can imply that an empty teapot contains tea, for example. Pretend plays a very early context in which children are called on to accept premises introduced by their partner and to respond in a consequential fashion. So here we go. In my um, categorization, I've said that I've called a playful or imaginative joint play or joint t talk as a mode of interaction which is sustained by both and doesn't have a goal, but it's potent for children's learning. I just want to stop at this point and um, kind of put a bit of a, I don't know if it's a damper, it's probably not the right word, on what I've said, because this is really, really heavily language influenced. It, this is really, there's a kind of as, assumption that everything is about children learning through language. And this says, I know you can't see it, Barbara, it's Barbara Rogoff's Apprenticeship in Thinking. So she's an anthropologist and she's done cross-cultural comparison between um, uh, Western children and children from um, a, a Maya, Mayan community and uh, other South American communities. And, and if you look at her, her work, you, you suddenly get a, a perspective on, on what you, you think and what the literature holds as kind of the, um, a, a norm and a normal way of doing things. So it, her work um, uh, is, is, is for, I, I'd love to go into it, but I can't. But it, what she does is put an emphasis on um, the uh, ob observation amongst um, observation as a means through which children learn, and that um, this way of learning, which is is um, she calls guided participation, happens in um, cultures which prioritise that as a way of organising learning, implicitly organising, and also in in cultures which are very kind of language. So both of those things exist on alongside one another. Okay, now on to technology. So this is the kind of thing that I found that uh, a lot of my families had. And I was actually quite surprised. But it turns out that um, people, they get handed on, or um, people, people kind of, they don't necessarily go out and buy them, but lots and lots of families with small children have got this somewhere in the cupboard. So um, in the videos that they gave back to me, um, they, there were examples of them using this, these things. So there's, that this one's called a leap pad, and that one's called a VTech laptop, and they're both modelled on the, um, the idea of a um, uh, laptop, and they have uh, games in, in them, um, and in, in each case, there's something that you press that's, like, that's similar, bears similarities to a laptop. So um, I've uh, transcribed my videos, um, looking at gesture and eye contact and uh, language. And um, it was really important to me not to fall into the trap that the critics of Fairchild study um, have made quite clear. I needed a means of analysing the interactions in a way that didn't carry taken for granted about goals and control. And I found that in this fascinating paper, um, which is from a journal um, mind, Culture and Activity, and I won't pronounce their names correctly, but it's Anna Marjanovic Shane and Lubyanka berlansky rustic It's called From Place You Are, Experience to Insight, and there's a big section about adult-child interaction where they develop the, um, the theory and then they apply it to adults doing drama together. So I don't know if you can see that, but what they they say is um, they're looking at an ana analytic unit of meaning making and they um, describe there's a, as a pr propositional <laughs> act that establishes a me three, that the active subject and you um, the relational subject and the topic which is a communicative object so um, let's go just go down here the there's a topic is established perhaps by pointing to something, but it could be by indication through language. So it's something that we're talking about. So we could, it could be pointing at that, or we could be talking about a dog. And that the the relationships are developed through comments. So it would be um, the, a, res a response or something that develops that topic. Oh yes, that's my table, 
or um, yes, a, a black dog. Uh, and this is a very simple example. Um, and that that, that be, then becomes the, uh, the new topic. So the interaction proceeds by this whole kind of chain of, of um, uh, es establishing and, and developing. But the thing they say that I think is fascinating is that relationships between the interactors are also, are also being developed at the same time. And uh, um, this, that's a kind of theme that I will come back to, although it's something that I didn't develop in, in my work. Okay. So I'd, how much time have I got left? Okay. Um, I can give you a detailed example of um, uh, analysis of what I did of a, this little girl, aged two and a half, using the leap pad at bedtime with her father. So her mum's holding the camera and her elder sister's also there in the, in the video. You can hear her talking. I'm not playing the video, but I do want to show you this. Oh, it's useless, I can't see it. Can you? Yeah, see if we can do it. So um, the, the little girl's here. She's got a drink of milk in her hand. There's the leap pad. She's holding the pen. She's pressing it with it on this interactive um, point. Her dad's lying behind her and he's, she's nestled against him. He's got his arm mm. around her. And um, as she presses the pen on the um, leap pad, it makes this noise, an electronic feedback noise. It goes dibbity doom. And um, on top of that, she gets, the father looks at her and he turns to her and as she feels, turns around smiles and he says what do you think he says Ooh. well done <laughs> yeah. so that became something that I, I was quite interested in like okay there's this whole social thing that's going on on top of this well done that's coming out of the machine and I, I watched for that as, it, as I went through and did this analysis so here's this the topic and the comment that I was talking about so we're talking about sharing attention, establishing a topic, and uh, what the second person does to, to um, uh, the comment, and whether the um, next person develops the topic. And uh, it enabled me to see this pattern that uh, I really um, possibly wouldn't have no noticed. So here we go. This is the one I've just shown you. So there's a jingle, and um, the, ma the dad says, <sighs> and looks at a little girl. And, and she turns around and goes, or oh, actually, it's not the well done, it's another one. Um, and she meets his, his gaze. And then the next time it happens, um, she initiates it, so she looks at him and smiles, and then he turns around and says, oh, good. And then we, that we have it a, a few, you know, just immediately afterwards. Um, she, he looks at her and rocks to side to side as there's music, and then she does um, the same <laughs> thing. Okay, late, later on, there's quite a lot of messing on the, around that kind of goes, goes on. So later on, um, there's another jingle as, as um, she presses something. And it's actually a kind of, it goes, rather going dibbly dee, it goes dibbly doo. So the little girl looks at the, the dad and smiles and makes eye contact. And he does something rather different. So he doesn't do one of these kind of, oh yes, kind of things. He he's makes eye contact and raises his eyebrows, tilts his head, has his hand on his shoulder, and then repeats the last word that the leap pad says. So it's, it's, it's a completely different type of response. And then, it, then the next time this noise happens, um, she does pretty much the same thing as, as last time. She smiles, <laughs> smiles at him. He puts his hand on her shoulder and, and does this kind of pause. So in neither of these cases he taken up her, her um, meaning making. And then uh, the last time it happens, um, she doesn't initiate anything. And the, um, so she's, she kind of stops doing this response to the music. So, um, so, so what I was interested, what, what seemed to be happening to me is um, something I thought was quite, it, in the context of the theoretical stuff I've been talking to you about, is that there's something quite interesting going on because actually what that dad could have done is 
to have used the whole leap pad as a whole game of making noises and, having, and enjoying them. And that was the, the kind of pattern of things that she, had, she was approaching with. Uh, and, and he didn't do that. And then the question is, well, why, he, why didn't he do that? And it's like, it's kind of a, it feels like a stupid question to ask, well, why didn't he do it? What, you know, what, why, why, didn't, why did, he, <coughs> did, did he change the way that he reacted to her as the, these different noises came out of the machine? Because they were errors. Yeah, and he knew they were errors. And how did he know what was supposed to be going on? The, the writing of the wrong things. Yeah, and where did he get that from? Mm. His life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so th to me, what's going on with this device is it invokes this idea about right answers, wrong answers, um, and that what you're supposed to do with it is to to uh, go through a series of operations that then provides you with the right answer. So, what's happening is in in this. If you think about this as a um, something that mediates um, uh, social interactions. Is, is that it's um, uh, setting up a it sets up a situation in which an instructional mode of interaction is the, pro the appropriate one. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one. Briefly, I don't go through the whole analysis. I use cartoon strip. <laughs> this little boy sits down at. Um, I think you can't see it at all. Useless. <laughs> anyway, it's a very cute little boy here sitting down at the blue <laughs> tech <laughs> laptop here, and the mum's just here. And he's, he says, I want to press horsey first, Mum. And she says, press 10. 10! So she goes, no. And then she pushes his hands out of the way and says, 1, presses the 1. 0, presses that. So it goes, 10! 2! And the, a voice comes out of the machine. And uh, in, in, res in response to that, or, you know, not in response to that, she says, right, press that one there. And, and uh, I think that's the end. So um, uh, that very brief extract is, is, is just to present to you, an, you know, another situation in which the child's making his own meaning. So this is about saying numbers and pressing them. And, um, but the, the mum's kind of persevering with, with, with the task. I've got another couple of examples. This one, um, the little girl, um, she uses this a lot. And she's, um, uh, she uses it on her own quite a lot. And she, what she does with it is um, she puts her favourite um, cassette in it, which plays the dialogue from a lot of dialogue from um, the Little Mermaid Disney film. And um, she, the, when she's using it on this occasion with her mum, who's holding the video behind her, um, she she initiates quite a lot of these kind of quite interesting bits of conversation about who's shouting at who, and they have this kind of nice exchange about um, being cross and the seals and what. It, you know, she's going to kill her. Oh, that sounds a bit stiff, isn't it? But the mom keeps saying, are you going to turn the page? Are you, are you going to turn the page? Go on to the next one. So this does really, it, you know, I hope it works for you because it certainly reminds me of this thing about the, the, in this situation, the, the, the adults working to get the child to making, the, making meaning of it in the same yeah. way as, as they are. And then... Um, uh, yeah, so actually what I wanted to do was give you that table again with the, the, um, uh, the, the modes, modes of interaction. But um, my point is really that um, we, we've, we've got these devices that invoke a particular kind of mode of interaction into, um, into the home um, in, in preschool settings and in a context of us now understanding that um, joint imaginative play or um, the children's child-motivated um, curiosity and questioning may be um, more effective ways for the child to, to, to support, for their child's learning to be supported and the basis on which they will subsequently learn from instruction when they get into school. So the, the um, I kind of take a message from that was, Instruction, isn't instruction in schooling is not well supported by um, inst instruction in the home. So um, lear learning as, uh, in, in, uh, that you might do at home in order to prepare a child for school isn't, is probably 
not well supported by um, devices that bring in this kind of particular mode of, mode of interaction. So um, uh, when, when uh, we're, we're talking about um, the artifact, sorry, I'm going to go past this because I'll just get bogged down a bit. Um, I, uh, on the front end of my thesis, it's a really long exploration about the, the picture book as an artifact that supports interaction between adults and children. And there are all sorts of bits of research literature which look at the, the kind of dialogue that happens between adults and children. And this, you know, it includes lots of stuff about questioning and, and imaginative and learning new vocabulary that the child might not have encountered and all sorts of concepts. And what it also does say is um, it, the way that a, an adult uses a book with a child doesn't depend on the book. It depends on their cultural notion or cultural background about what it's right to do with the book. So there's nothing in a book to stop you saying, what, you know, what's this, that, that's a red horse, well done. Mm -hmm. So one family might use it that way, and another family might use it in a very imaginative way. So, so the, the, the key thing is, it's never just the artifact. It would be perfectly possible for people to use a book or a leap pad or anything in the way that they felt was important if that's what they want to do. But the thing about those those um, uh, leap pads and so on is that it does bring it emphasis this instructional mode of interaction. And I haven't mentioned the word agency, <laughs> but I hope <laughs> you understand right. that yes. what I'm. Yeah, there's a lot okay. of agencies. Yeah, <laughs> there's a, a the child's agency is is more pronounced in the the playful and in questioning. Oh look, I did actually have something about agency. Okay, so according to Vygotsky, it's through social interaction that children are, are develop voluntary attention to and volition. Um, and I, in my work, I have um, concentrated on the idea that um, it's in the, if the child has agency in, in the interaction, then learning is more likely to happen. Well, that's kind of a simplistic um, way of, of, of articulating what I've said. But then there's this interesting thing, isn't there, about what well, does the child develop their own sense of agency in life, you know, as, a, as an autonomous agent or whatever, through interaction. And I think the f kind of focus of this conference is, is to say yes, you know, yes, yeah, yes. If you are repeatedly given um, uh, opportunities to exercise ag agency, then you, we think you're going to become a more agentic person. I, I kind of think that it's a slight um, le leap of faith, but then it might not be, but certainly it seems to be there in what Vygotsky says. So here am I kind of puzzling away about like kind of, well, you know, what, what, what do we understand agency, what do we think it is, and, and what do we want our children to, to become, and how will we know we've got it, they've got it. And so in my reading, and I'm going to get really fuzzy here because I'm not sufficiently fluent with the concepts or the literature, so you're going to have to forgive me. Um, that I've looked in archaeology um, because they're interested in artefacts and cognition. Fantastic. They go around looking, finding artefacts and then they have to work, try and work backwards to how these things were used and how people thought and what their lives were like. So they theorise agency in relation to artefacts. So there's a guy called John Rubb, I think he's at the University of Cambridge, and I've got his paper, and he's done a, quite a nice historical survey um, of, of theory around agency. And he said, it, certainly in archaeology, it was always originally thought of as intentional action. So it's a kind of, that it, originally, it was taken for granted that um, you intend to be a king and defeat lots of people and, you know, become a, and you're, if you, ha you have agency, if you're the sort of person who, you know, kind of can go out and do that, does that. So I'm really glossing this, I tell you. But then, then um, as, as um, uh, Bourdieu, Bourdieu and, and those other theorists kind of come in, um, agency seems uh, uh, is, is theorised as something in dialectic. So we're going back to John Potter yesterday, talking about the dark matter structure, the dark matter of agency, the other side. So the dialectic is between um, the, this this individual as as agentic, but they're um, uh, acting, reproducing, or constrained by by the culture. So there's this constant interplay. So it sort of denies um, completely 
um, this idea of, of agency it being in the individual, so you express it within the structure and through structure, and you're recreating um, society and culture at the same time. And then um, the third one, he says, more recently, since 2000, um, there's a, a um, perspective on agency as relational. And you will probably guess that that's the sort of idea that I like, because going back to that analysis from um, the, with the, the topic comment and so on, there's this interesting point in that paper about the development of relationship between people. And so there's something kind of important about the development of agency in, in relationship. I'll be done in a minute. Um, and and relate, uh, agency as, it, as expressed in and through relationship. Now, this is how I'm finishing. Um, and um, this comes from a philosopher called Sean Gallagher. He's a philosopher in cognitive science, scientist. And his field is about in, embodied cognition. So in this paper, um, I've got all the references on the end, by the way. Um, he, he says um, that we are in relationship all the time. And the, the um, child, as it develops in the, in the womb, becomes able to feel in an environment where there's this constant ebb and, and flow, and it's aware awareness of the mother's body. So the body and thinking the, in his work are, are, are completely inextricable. So there's n this idea about thinking just being something inside the, the grey matter is, is um, the, the thing that he, he challenges. Don't expect me to be fluent around this. I'm at the beginning of reading this. But, but his paper, which is called Strong Interaction and Self-Agency, um, makes this, this point. Um, whatever, and he's talking about self-agency, which seems to be, as I understand it, the thing about kind of being aware that it was you who decided to do something and that you are able to do it. He says it's weaved out of a fabric of interaction. It's not a characteristic of the individual, but a characteristic of a set of relationships. In some of my interactions, I am freer than in others. Some arrangements support self-agency and some do not. I could say without contradiction, contradiction that I am free and I'm not free, but only in the sense that my self-agency is constituted in my different relations differently. And that <coughs> was the last slide. Oh, no, it wasn't actually. There's a question about rethinking design, but I think I'll leave that because... Um, I'm already sw swimming around in a complex soup of not quite understanding things. Okay, thanks.